Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Wright and uh, Nick. Okay, thank you. It's a, you know it's a good start to a talk when they clap before you even say anything, so. All right, uh, which of these things am I hitting the buttons on? These, okay. Hopefully I didn't just break anything. I'm gonna, I'll stand over on this side for. All right, so this is uh, some work that we're doing on malware and adversarial machine learning. And uh, this is at least most of the research team, including Professor Pan, um, Dr. Mosley, who is a former PhD student with Dr. Pan, I guess uh, Bo has been involved in some of this as well, and a whole bunch of students. All right, so I'm gonna start with like a high level introduction to machine learning in security. And machine learning can be used for lots of things in security. Uh, anything where detection is involved, and of course there's a lot of things, right? Um, of these, Malware is the one we're really talking about today, so I'm highlighting that. Also, anything where we're doing grouping or clustering of things or classifying of things, such as into malware families. So that's also where we can use machine learning. Uh, let's see, I am going to try setting this here so I get more consistent. Oh yes, that's better. All right, so machine learning is great, but of course the new hotness is deep learning and everyone's using it for everything these days. So why is that? And my simple uh, and oversimplified answer is, well, let's look at this ImageNet thing. ImageNet is a data set of millions of images from the internet. And the idea is we want to be able to test whether computers can understand what's inside of an image. And we don't, when we don't, when we say understand, we don't really mean understand, understand, but at least at some high level, like get something out, get some information out of it. Because ImageNet is too easy to say and too easy to remember, we instead use this acronym ILSVRC, which is representing a subset of the ImageNet data set that covers 1.2 million images over 1,200 categories, so 1,000 images per category. And so this is a data set for each of the categories is going to be something like a distinct object, chair, desk, uh, I think there's airplane, ship, truck, uh, you might have field, car, horse, orange, banana, right? All these different types of objects. And this graph gives a good illustration of why deep learning is, has become so hot. So a decade ago, in 2011, the state of the art in machine learning on the ImageNet data set, the ILS VRC, uh, this is top five classification error. That means that you give the machine learning algorithm five chances to get it right. If it gets it right in any of those five tries, then it counts as it got it right, and otherwise it got it wrong. Um, even though you're giving it five tries, in 2011, the best that they could do without deep learning was 26% error. The very next year, when they introduced AlexNet, which is the first major deep learning algorithm that's been actually useful, it got almost 10% less error. So this huge jump in the amount of error, and that steadily got better with improvements in the technology. And we get to 2014, we're at about 7% error. And then a expert in the field says, well, that's really cool. 7% error, that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to train myself. So I'm going to sit down with these images. It's actually harder than you think. There's like, I think there's like 120 breeds of dog. Right? So there are some challenging aspects to the data set. And he sat down with the images and just trained himself on the hard examples, like how can I distinguish between that breed of dog and this breed of dog, or between you know, this thing that I didn't quite know the name of this object before, and, and some of these other things. So he was able to get himself to 5% error. And he's like, okay, great. So it's still the case that humans are better than computers. But I think you probably know where this is going. By the very next year, we're down to 3.6% and so on. And of course, this keeps on improving. So we can say, with the caveats, 
within a fairly narrow range, on a fairly narrowly defined problem, but a problem that 10 years ago, we thought, sure, that humans would always be better than computers at, we now get superhuman performance by using deep learning. And so that is, so results like that are the kind of thing that lead to a revolution in computing like we see today. And that includes in security. But there's this adversarial machine learning. And adversarial, of course, in security is what we're all about. So what does this mean? One of the things that it means is that you can trick a classifier. Here is, so the CIFAR 10 data set is kind of like ImageNet, but with a lot smaller images. And this just depicts, and there's only 10 classes. There's like bird, airplane, truck, automobile, car, um, you know, a, a few others, a plane. So here we have a picture of a dog. Here you have a picture of a dog that's been slightly modified, and you can see some of those modifications. But you can see there's also a very small image. And that does not trick you into thinking that this is a bird. But if you take one of those state-of-the-art deep learning classifiers I was just talking about and you ask it what this is, it goes, oh yeah, that's a bird. Right? And that's really weird. And trying to understand that has been a big and interesting research topic in machine learning and security uh, ever since people figured this out in about 2014. Here's some more examples. I think these might be from the ImageNet data set. Um, so for example, at the top on the left, you see a bus. In the middle, you see some noise that has been added to the picture of the bus. Um, and then on the right, you also see the picture of the bus. And if you look at the two pictures, now that I see them in kind of this resolution, I think maybe I can see small differences. Uh, maybe not. It's very subtle. What they've, in order to, to show this noise, they've actually taken the noise and amplified it, like just multiplied the amount of noise that you're seeing by a whole lot in order to make it visible. So you end up with pictures that are all very much the same as they were over here. However, so none of those purple and green dots like we saw on the previous slide. However, a state-of-the-art machine learning classifier thinks that these are all an ostrich. And Here's some more. And the state of the art machine learning classifier thinks that all of these are also an ostrich. Yes. And so the, the other part about this is that if you make enough manipulations, you can get it. So not only does the machine learning classifier think that this is an ostrich, it goes from being like over here, it was probably like, oh, I'm like, you know, 90% certain that this is a dog or maybe 70% certain. And over here, it's like, oh yeah, I'm 99.9% .9 certain this is an ostrich. That is the most ostrichy looking ostrich I have ever seen. Right. So that tells you some, some things about deep learning and machine learning. They're not, right, it's not the same as human intelligence, and we get some really weird outputs and some really weird results. Now, it doesn't really, like, you're probably like, okay, so I can trick a classifier into thinking my dog is actually an ostrich. Yippee. But there are some things that you can do with it that are potentially more impactful uh, or like vehicle impactful. In the case of these stop signs, these stop signs have all been manipulated. So this is a poster print. So the print, you have to print out a poster. Um, it's got, you see, it's got a little bit of like weird dark spots and stuff going on. Um, you would, you'd kind of print that out, you maybe cut it out and s stick it onto some metal in order to, to make it into a sign. Uh, this one is you take the original stop sign and you add these carefully placed stickers. This one is the same as this, these carefully placed stickers, but set up in such a way that you get, um, you turn it into like love stops hate. That's the, the idea of this. So. In all of these cases, what you get is that you've turned the signs in from being a stop sign that a, um, a uh, what's the cars without the drivers? Self-driving cars. Self cars, thank you very much. 
Yeah, you take the self-driving cars and you point the cameras at them and they go, oh, that's not a stop sign, that's a 45 mile an hour sign. Vroom. Uh, in the lab, they get 100% misclassification rates, so they're able to trick the camera and the, the deep learning system 100% of the time. In a moving vehicle, it goes to 84%, so it's still pretty, pretty dangerous. And then here's another one that has some like security-like implications. If you want to trick a, fa uh, a face recognition system, you put on one of these fancy sets of glasses. And uh, so this is, the first one is, so this researcher, who's Luyo, Luyo gets classified as this other person. This is Luyo getting classified as Mila Djokovic. Um, and so on, right? And so you can get all, all, any combination, you can make yourself appear to be anybody you would like to the facial recognition system. Um, you would need some pictures of the person you're trying to impersonate, but then you just wear the funny glasses. So a lot of these have to do with images. Let's get back to the world of security. And so what does this have to do with malware classification? Well, if what you're doing with, now if you actually go into, and I've talked with um, someone who works at Mandiant, and he said, well, what we actually use are not deep learning networks, but these other things, but we do research on deep learning networks because there's always the possibility that if they turn out to be better, if we're able to get something that is better or more effective in some way, then we would have a good reason to switch to them. Also, it turns out all of the attacks that I've shown you, if they work against deep learning, it turns out they often work even better against non-deep learning systems. In any case, um, if you were able to trick a classifier, like we've just seen, you can trick image classifiers, that means you could also trick malware classifiers. Now, this isn't as quite as easy as it is for images. The nice thing about images from the perspective of fooling a classifier, you can make these really subtle little changes um, and you can basically take any pixel and you can't make it, there's some boundary on the pixel, but pretty much you know, each pixel is, you know, it's red and green and blue and it has, you know, basically it can be um, a little bit more green or a little bit more blue or a little bit more red. You've got quite a bit of flexibility. You can add and subtract. Right, in any of, so in all of these dimensions. You can't just, the only thing is you can't go below zero amount of blue, you can't go above maximum amount of blue, right, so you're zero to 255 kind of range, but you know, you can just use that as a cap and then it's all good. It's still, it's a pretty straightforward problem. When it comes to malware, things are a little bit tricky. There's two options that you would have as an attacker. One is you could retain all of the basic functionality of the malware uh, by adding features, right? So you have all of the, the malware does X, it does Y, it does Z. You say, okay, well, I'm also gonna do add, you know, function A and B and C onto that and see if I can use that to, to trick the classifier. That's not usually going to be sufficient at the end of the day um, because it still does X and Y and Z. And if X and Y or Z are like go off and do this malicious stuff, right? all you have to do is just train a classifier to deal with this added noise. So what's better is if you can take features that are, uh, and when we say features, it could be a lot of different things, and we'll talk a little bit about that before I kind of switch gears and hand things over to, to Nicholas, that, but some of the features are just like, well, what's the malware doing? Or what are, what's the actual code of the malware? And we can take some of that and we can replace it with equivalent functionality. So instead of, you might have an instruction that's like, uh, you know, add, add these two registers and put them into this other register. And you can say, well, add these, uh, add these two values put them into one register, and then copy that register into the other, other register that you wanted to put it in, or something like that. So, so those are some options. Um, but of course, what you can't do is subtract functionality. Because if you start subtracting functionality, then the malware isn't going to do what you wanted to do. Um, also, any change that you make, it has to actually show up in code. Right, it has to, show, or the you know, or the behavior of of the system somehow, 
Um, and it has to still be able to run, so you can't have runtime errors, you know, you can't introduce new bugs that are going to break things, and you can't remove functionality. So those are all kind of additional constraints that are making things difficult. Nevertheless, people have done some work and already made um, malware that does evade certain classifiers. Um, so just real quickly, static versus dynamic. In static analysis, we're only dealing with code, metadata, things that we can see without running the malware. And then dynamic uh, is when we run the malware in a sandbox and we see what kind of behaviors it does. And the simplest version of that, and the one we're gonna kind of focus on, is API calls. So what if we run it and we get a list of the API calls that the, that the malware makes, and then we have benign software and we run it and we see what kind of calls it makes. Uh, API calls are a very good way to see what the malware is doing because they really represent it, they represent what it's doing to interface with the system. So whatever it's doing internally, like inside its own memory, eh, whatever, right? It could do all sorts of crazy stuff in order to obfuscate what it's up to. But when it comes down to, it needs to have an effect on the system. It needs to save a file. It needs to open a network port, right? Those types of things that are actually going to be where you see malicious behavior also getting connected in, those require some interface with the system. And if you watch that interface, most of that is going to be through API calls. And that is going to give you, in some sense, a more reliable signal of, no, this really is malware. We can see it doing X and Y and Z. That's a malicious pattern of behavior. So at the high level, the challenges that we have are, we want to be able to understand what is it attackers can do. So we know that it is possible to come up with ways to, to trick a classifier, and we've uh, done some research on how we might be able to trick classifiers in the image domain that, you know, make, uh, that we think can be useful when we translate them over to the malware domain. The, so we can come up with these adversarial examples. We can make sure that they make malware that is both able to fool the classifier and keep its functionality and still work. So we want to make sure we understand what are those capabilities, what can the attacker do. Given this, we want to be able to generate some data. And this is where some of what Nick, Nicholas is going to talk about comes in, is that we, machine learning relies heavily on data. I said before with ImageNet, we've got thousand images for every single class, right? A thousand images of a table, a thousand images of a chair, a thousand images of uh, a horse. And it's just we need a lot of that data to extract patterns because different pieces of malware are going to be different from each other and how exactly they, op they operate and exactly what they're doing. Um, in terms of behavioral if we're doing API dynamic uh, checking, then we really need to get data that involves running the software. We can't get that any other way. We can't just take a malware sample, look at it, and say, oh, that's what it's going to do, because then we could do it with static analysis. We have to actually do it with dynamic analysis by running it. So that's an additional challenge here in order to be able to do anything else in terms of detecting malware and adversarial malware. And then finally, like a final step, as if it's going to be simple, is to develop and test defenses. So come up with ways to make classifiers more robust or to detect that something is an adversarial piece of software, in which case we just assume at that point it's malware, but to do something so that we're able to prevent an attacker from being able to successfully evade um, deep learning-based classification. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Nicholas. Hello? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. So, um, as Dr. Wright mentioned, 
Um, my project was, my research was kind of uh, based around the area of generating data. So I'm going to explain that real quick. Um, my project had to do with a software called Cuckoo Sandbox, which is a software that takes a malware sample and runs it in a sandbox environment, as you know, it's pretty obvious by the name, and um, takes a lot of data. So everything that the malware does is recorded in the report, which is viewable. It's a JSON file, and you can go through it and, and take all sorts of data that you want. So the objectives of my project were to get a diverse set of API calls, because what we want is to compare malicious versus benign uh, API calls and be able to generate those data sets for machine learning so that these models that we make in the future can tell the difference. Um, the second uh, objective was to have a range of compatibility with different software. So generally, um, you know, I was working with Windows 7, as you'll see in one of the next slides. It's not the most used um, software, but it's sort of a proof of concept. We have a lot of freeware, a lot of shareware, Windows utilities that are often manipulated. Um, you know, everyone knows about calculator. Um, and also to rely on mostly back-end graphics elements. So that means that we want to interact on the system level with these applications, be able to um, generate these API calls without much static or, or noise in the background um, and sort of emulate a real person. Um, and then the final objective was to integrate into the existing human.py module in Cuckoo, which is its simulated user interaction module. So a lot of dynamic, uh, dynamic malware analysis applications use uh, simulated user interaction as a way to get malware to do what it wants to do. So installation windows, it will click OK on that. Um, any sorts of like yes buttons, sort of, uh, I guess, dialogues that come up, it would click on it. But right now, for generating data, that's not quite enough. We want to generate a lot of API calls so that we can delve into the data a little bit further. So real quick, I'm going to go over the methodology here. Um, my host is a Windows 10 machine with a um, Windows 7 uh, Ultimate VM for testing my scripts and an Ubuntu machine that's connected with uh, Cuckoo Sandbox and it has multiple different virtual machines that are connected to that virtual machine um, for analysis. Um, so basic process of the script. It's not too complicated. It checks if an application is open. If it is open, then it connects to that existing session. If it's not, it starts a new session. After that, it's going to execute a series of reasonable inputs depending on the application. So something that a user might actually do if they're you know, interacting with that application. So let's say I'm in Notepad. One thing I could do in Notepad is type a few lines, save a file, you know, uh, select all, like some hotkeys, stuff like that. Simple stuff and then close the application. So I collected the data. As I said before, Cuckoo has a, um, has a report that it generates with all of the API data. And I took that, ran it through a JSON parser, parser that I wrote, and visualized the data with some bar graphs and some histograms that we're going to see on the next slide. Oh, also, I just wanted to mention um, this was written in Microsoft UIA backend. So a lot of Windows 32 programming um, was done in, in terms of high-level languages like Python was done directly through Win Windows 32. But Microsoft came out with a brand new sort of developer space that could interact with Windows 32 APIs better. So that's what I used. Um, also, the libraries, the Python libraries I used were um, PyAuto GUI and PyWinAuto. So these are some of my results. Um, as you can see, um, I have the module, the unique API calls and counts here. So, for example, my Internet Explorer script generated 273 unique API calls and 73,094 total API calls. Um, yes, okay. So, I just want to talk about some of the issues I had. 
um, because everyone loves to hear about those. So I don't know if you guys know about Cuckoo at all, but it is famously hard to set up. Um, it requires an older version of Python, a bunch of dependencies at specific versions, and some of them aren't compatible with each other. So it requires a lot of workaround to be able to do effectively. Another problem I had was um, one of the Python libraries I worked with, PyAuto GUI, was extremely buggy. Um, not all of, it, all of its functions worked as intended. It was a kind of a total mess. Um, but I made it work with some things like mouse scrolls, mouse movement, um, and uh, so that worked. As you can see, I have a little screenshot here of um, some really bad coordinate-based uh, code that you can do with PyAuto GUI. Um, and then obviously, like I said before, Cuckoo, kind of hard to set up, so data collection and testing was um, definitely was a, uh, you know, try and error, trial and error sort of, uh, sort of thing, but I made it work in the end, so I'm good with that. Okay, so conclusion here. What did we learn? From this research, we learned that we can generate data sets that can compare between, or it is possible to generate data sets. We can take this API data and we can make it into a data set for a machine learning algorithm. Obviously, that's not fully integrated yet, but uh, it is possible. And with the data that we're seeing, um, it's, it would be very uh, useful. Um, what was the, was the research successful in the objective? I'd say it was fairly successful. Um, I think that we, or I developed something that can be better uh, developed in the future to be able to do a lot of things. So as you can see, future goals, again, helping populate data sets for machine learning with behavior-based based data, because with static data, you can't, um, it can be fooled easier. So in terms of what we're, look, we're looking for in the world of malware analysis is being able to, you know, in static analysis, you can add functionality. But when it actually does things and it executes those APIs, you can't hide that. You can't hide that from, from um, a behavior-based system. So, yes. Uh, in terms of the script, I have a couple personal goals, which is less coordinate-based controls because that doesn't work. Not every virtual machine, not every machine is going to have the same resolution. Um, so that's really bad. Um, especially for the Acrobat module. I don't know what the Adobe developers were thinking, but they designed their backend so badly, um, I could barely get through it. It was like, it was just horrible. Um, and then full integration with Cuckoo Sandbox, so I'd like to make it a full auxiliary module that um, people from the community can download and use and be able to generate their own data sets for machine learning so that it sort of you know, can become a community thing. Um, and then a wider range of commands and inputs for each module. Obviously, what someone might do with Internet Explorer is a bit more nuanced than, for example, I made mine go to Google and search up cat videos and click on a cat video. There's much more nuanced inputs that a user can do than that, so that's something that um, would be nice to work on in the future. And then, you know, increase adaptability with errors. It's kind of a given. Thank you. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I can do a quick question and answer if anyone has any questions, and Dr. Wright will certainly be able to answer any you guys have as well. Also from the chat, if anyone wants to, wants to ask any questions. So um, how can students get uh, more involved in research? Because I know that you, as a second year, had the opportunity to do research. Like, tell us your experience of um, how you got involved in that research. Yeah, sure. So it's, um, it's, it's mainly networking. Um, I think that everyone will be very surprised at what opportunities are out there if they just go ask. Um, I know that the, the cybersecurity, I know everyone who's a computing security major will have their academic advisor. If you reach out to them and say, hey, I'm looking to do research this summer or this term, would you mind reaching out to faculty and seeing if they have any opportunities available? And they'll be happy to do that, and you can also also do it yourself and just go out and look. 
Um, personally, I'm in the honors program, so they offer some extra support for that as well. But if you're not, it still works. It still works, and, and you know, you can find research pretty much wherever you look. Yeah. And I guess uh, it helps on the, you know, not this one might be normal. Okay, so I'll just speak less. So the other thing I'd add to that is that um, please reach out to me. So I'm the director of research for GCI, and so I have a lot of insight not only as to what's going on in the CSEC department, but as to, you know, there's researchers who do security-related research in CS, in software engineering, in computer engineering, actually in, in some other departments as well. Um, so that's harder. The advisors are not going to know that as well. Um, and I also can also, based on what you're interested in, I can help match you with different people. So if you're interested in this project, of course you can talk to me, you can talk to Dr. Chan. But uh, you talk to me about any research you might be interested in, and I can help put you in touch with a potential advisor, uh, an expert, even someone outside of RIT. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, also, one thing I'd like to mention is that I will give the source code for the script to anyone who wants it, who wants to work on it. Um, there's a lot of open ends that you can you can work on different avenues. So if you just want to play around with something, let me know. I'm on the um, I'm on the Discord, RIT Sec, Nicholas. I think I'm the only one named Nicholas. It's just lowercase. <laughs> so just, just. That's actually shocking. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so send me a PM and I'll run you through it. I, um, I tried to add some, some comments that made it pretty easy to understand. Um, so that as well. And um, yeah, thank you guys very much for letting me um, talk about this. I appreciate it. All right, awesome. And